Now, ladies and gentlemen, Chamber Chats this evening bring you a young couple from Westport and Galway. <laughs> uh, as part of these chats, we talk to people who are in business in Westport and we have a little discussion about where they come from and what they do and how they're coping with the problems we have at the moment. So tonight I want to introduce you to Oliver White, might sound familiar, and Alicia Loftus, husband and wife, and I have to make a confession here, they are my, in, my son and my in-law. So uh, in case we we're accused of bias, I thought it might be appropriate to have them on in view of the, the rapid spread of COVID and the diversity of it. So we we'll start off by asking Alicia, where are you from? I'm from Galway originally, um, did my training in Galway and a um, bit of my GP training between Galway and Mayo mm. and that's how I ended up here. And Oliver? Uh, I'm from Westport yeah. and did training in Dublin, Northern Ireland, Sligo, Mayo and back to Westport. And how long are you in Westport now? I'm here about six years I think mm. and you're back. How long? I'm back since 2009. So. Coming up on 11 years, 10 and a half years back. So you came to an established practice? We did, yeah, we did indeed. And I you were you well. <laughs> you were members of the Chamber of Commerce. We are indeed. Yeah. So we yeah. used to think it was a vocation that uh, doctors were a vocation. Now why would you be a member of the Chamber of Commerce? Well, the, ch the Chamber does great work. Um, promotes businesses and the well-being of the town. Um, so it's important to contribute to it if you can. Uh, and I suppose as well, in reality, even though it's a vocation and service, it is a business. If you don't run it like a business, it'll be closed down pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So we've got bills to pay like everyone else. And um, so I suppose we'd have um, yeah, a lot of the same interests as other people in, in services and business around the town would have too. Yeah. And what do you think of Westport as a town? I suppose Alicia should be the more objective about that. Yeah, I love it. I mean, um, I suppose I would have come from Galway, which would have, I think, a similar feel to Westbourne in terms of being, um, yeah, I suppose a real mix of people. Um, and I suppose a lot of people kind of coming in from a tourist point of view and things like that as well. It's a fairly vibrant town and, and one that seems to be kind of busy all year round, really. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's a great place to live and work and raise a family. And... Uh... What would you think is the strong part, apart from what you've said already, of, of the town? Um, I think there's a really strong sense of kind of community and cooperation. Um, I think for like um, groups like the Tidy Towns and things like that, you know, when they put out requests for people to come and help out, you know, there always seems to be a good response. Mm. I think there's a um, kind of a great sense of cohesiveness among all the businesses in, in the town in terms of, you know, wanting to do what's best for the town rather than kind of necessarily competing with each other people seem to work well together um, and I think that's something that we've noticed you know with other say GP surgeries in the town as well that you know it's very much a sense of that we're all in it together and you know that you want what's best for the town and, and that you know what's best for your business kind of comes from that then. Is there a good there is good cooperation among the doctors in the town there is? Oh definitely yeah yeah there's I think there's always been a good sense of kind of yeah collegiality and of helping each other out and if you know, if anyone's ever off sick at short notice and things, we'll, we'll always cover for each other. Um, so yeah, that was something that I really noticed in the beginning was just how like just friendly and cooperative the, the GPs were with each other. Well, I can tell you that it was that way when I came here in 1972, there was a great cooperation among the villa. Good. <laughs> so um, we have a problem at the moment, mm -hmm. COVID-19. How is it affecting yeah. you personally and the practice? Um, well, I suppose from the practice point of view, it's been there have been some fairly significant changes um, that happened really very quickly. Um, so, I think almost overnight at one stage, um, we had suddenly gotten obviously the case numbers were starting to increase. We were anticipating um, an exponential rise in the number of cases, and we were advised that we would have to stop. I suppose having large groups of people sitting in the waiting room, and um, that we'd need to be assessing every person who came in to see if they might have respiratory tract symptoms or you know cough or cold symptoms um, and effectively that ended our walk-in clinics so we would have always had a number of appointments every day but also then would have allowed people just to come into the door and um, 
ask to see a doctor and then they would just wait, you know, take a seat and wait until one of us was free to see them. Um, and that's, you know, that was gone then overnight, really, that we, just, we couldn't facilitate that anymore because it wasn't safe. And um, so effectively, for the first time, we had to sort of lock our door and um, just triage everyone over the phone um, who wanted to come in. Um, so that was a really big change. And it, it um, yeah, it, it was a, a huge difference the way we run the business usually, you know, so yeah. that was the first thing that, that was the difference, I think. Um, yeah, so when it, came, when it came in first, um, the restrictions, people were literally uh, avoiding us like the plague. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was very, very quiet in parts, but really busy on the phones and using internet and email. And um, so that was, that was where we were really busy. Uh, and then myself and Alicia kind of a little bit staggered, but we had to stay out of work physically because we had, to, we had a, a cough. Um, like we were very well, but we had to wait for swaps to come back, and then it took ages to come back. So, and um, we we had to do our fourteen days and um, manage everything over the phone. Really, yeah, we were kind of working again purely by phone, no physical uh, consultations. And again, thankfully, our colleagues covered us. You know, and yeah. if they if, if there was a patient that we really needed to physically see, they would have seen them for us. And um, yeah, so, that was massive yeah. for us really to, to have that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of changes, and and it's actually kind of driven innovation online so a lot of electronic services and uh, video calls and that now still you can't beat a physical consultation to put your hand on a patient and check their clinical signs and that's a really important part of your consultation so i don't think that like video calls are are going to replace everything yeah that was one of the things that i found towards the end of the two week uh, kind of um quarantine period or whatever or just waiting for the results to come back and um, that you would maybe have phone consultations with certain patients and then you follow up by phone and then you'd have to follow up again by phone. And by the end of it, it was just really like, there is just no other way but to see a patient now at this point, you know? So I think there's definitely um, a limit to how much you can achieve on a phone consultation. Although it is, you know, it's something that we've obviously had to grapple with over the last few weeks um, and kind of become more familiar with, more comfortable with, I guess, you know? So we certainly, Adible, but yeah, we prescribed a lot, more, a lot more antibiotics than we would normally because, um, we just just cover the patient when they did have a cough, couldn't listen to their, them, yeah. their chest, uh, to decide if they properly need it or not. So, but look, in the current situation, that's the best practice to do it. And uh, look, it'll... Mayo seems to have a good few uh, comparis in comparison to other counties, isn't it? Mayo does, is it? Yeah, it is. It is. It's kind of a very close... Per head of population. I don't know, actually. I think we probably have a lot. I suppose because the, the testing criteria have narrowed a lot now, it's difficult to know you know, we could have people that we suspect strongly might have it, but they may not be in a, you know, be meeting the criteria for testing. So I'm actually, I think they're again, gaining more kind of anecdotal data about who, who might have it, but we don't know for definite really. But I think relatively speaking, the West is not, not terribly bad as far as I know, you know, I mean, certainly for, to Dublin and that. yeah, the big cities are, are they're kind of near capacity, aren't they? And in intensive care beds, whereas mm -hmm. in regional hospitals, they happen to come to that. So that's great. That's, that's the whole flattening of the curve. It yeah, it's, it's, so. it's how does it compare to the seasonal flu that comes every December, January, February? In terms of, I think looking at it, I mean, I think it's more contagious, you know. And again, that's I think that's based on the data that's coming out, but also anecdotally, like from you know, we when we are looking at how patients contract it and things, it, it definitely seems to be spread a bit more easily than the flu. Um, and I think, um, probably the percentage of people who need to be manage more aggressively in hospital or in, in intensive care units is, is probably higher as well than the, the seasonal flu, I think. Mm. Um, and obviously it's the fact that because none of us have any kind of immunity or there isn't any even a partial vaccine for it, um, I think it's just the fear of being overwhelmed if everybody gets it all at the one time, you know, that, that we just wouldn't have the capacity to, to help everybody who needs yeah. assistance with breathing and things. Yeah, so annually, I think it's around four to 500 deaths per year attributed to the flu virus in Ireland. And with the COVID were around a thousand mark at the moment, mm -hmm. so it's, it's certainly more dangerous. Um, thankfully, eighty percent of people have a mild illness, and uh, some people don't even know they've had it when it's gone through them, which is good for them. Um, so yeah, it's, there's a lot of unknowns about it, and a lot of people are are watching it, and strategies are adjusting accordingly. So uh, we'll see how that goes. And certainly going to be a massive e economic impact, and that's for sure. Yeah. That yeah. is. I'm feeling myself that the, the season of flu killed a lot more, but it was put down as pneumonia rather than flu or whatever, you know. Because yeah. uh, flu, uh, pneumonia is a very common complication of uh, 
clues. That's true, yeah, yeah. yeah. I suppose I think, I uh, it could have been handled any differently nationally. These are all theoretically questions, by the way. So. Yeah. yeah, I think I think they I think they I think it was good that they were very much led by the experts, you know, because um, I think there was kind of a, probably a, a habit internationally of kind of eschewing expertise um, that it wasn't a popular thing to follow what the experts were saying. But I think in the case of the Irish government, they really just let public health decide what was necessary and they just, they sort of acted on that really yeah. very quickly, I think, you know, I do think, I think Ireland did do reasonably well. I know you could argue about sort of that there were still flights coming into Ireland and we were still letting people back from Italy when we knew there was an outbreak there and things. But um, I think, you know, you're always going to look back on these and, and, and I suppose judge the decisions that were made with the benefit of hindsight. Um, but it's, I mean, we even felt at the time when, when initially all of the new guidance was coming through, you know, the, the guidance for us as a general practitioner was, was changing like nearly hour to hour. So you'd come in in the morning, you'd be like, okay, so here's the, here are the rules for today. This is how we're going to engage with people. This is what we're being advised. And then, you know, an hour later, the guidance would be updated and you'd have to change how everything was running all over again. Um, and I think it was, it's really stressful trying to respond to information that's coming through that rapidly when you're having to make such massive changes based on that information. So I think, you know, I think you need to take all of the looking back over the decisions, you know, and just remember that this information was coming in really quickly and decisions were having, having to be made really rapidly. So I think overall they did pretty well in my opinion anyway. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's debate like with the way the strategy that Sweden took, is that better or worse or what? So again, a lot of unknowns, people aren't, aren't sure about this virus and, um, yeah, the, the amount of people that are estimated to have it is, is about 10 times the official figures. Mm -hmm. So I think when it's reported news, like so many people are positive for test positive, that's not really, I suppose, accurate as such. It, and it's not hugely helpful in a way because a lot more people have, have it than that figure. What is important is how many people have died or how many people are using intensive care beds. I think they're the big, they're figures that are, are actually important. Yeah, I suppose that tells us our capacity to manage it and, you know, um, whether we're getting overwhelmed or not. I think that's the key thing because, yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, when you look at, say, the way other governments have handled it and the Swedish approach and all of that, I mean, look, you know, again, everyone's just making decisions um, a, a very, on a very kind of immediate basis. Um, but I think the theory that Sweden were following and possibly the UK initially as well of kind of herd immunity um, was kind of, you know, understandable in principle. But I think when you look at the realities of what COVID-19 means in terms of just so many people needing intensive care treatment and so many people needing ventilation and, and like quite a significant death rate, even with ventilation in ICU, um, I think then you can see that like, yeah, the herd immunity, <clears throat> albeit it might make sense on paper, the reality is it, it means that people will die unnecessarily. And I just think, yeah, you just, it's not something that you can do, you know, it's not right. And I think probably even though the way we're handling things in Ireland now is very painful from an economic point of view, and I'm sure there'll be a huge reckoning for it down the line. Um, but I think, yeah, you have to try and prioritize saving as many lives as possible, which is, I think, the, the only route really that you can go through until we know more at least about the virus and, and how to handle it and how to manage it better, you know. Could you shoot a guess at how long more it might last? I'm cocooned. I need to get out for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's going to be, it, like, it certainly seems as though it's going to turn out possibly to be something similar to the flu where it will just circulate, you know. Um, but I think maybe as our immune systems become exposed to it gradually over time, um, you know, that possibly it will become less dangerous to us. Um, and maybe we will be able to develop some strategies in terms of, medication to treat it and some kind of vaccine, even maybe similar to the flu vaccine that albeit the virus may shift a little bit from year to year, we may not get perfect coverage um, or protection from a vaccine, but at least it will give us some chance of, I suppose, capping the numbers of people who, who fall really ill from it, uh, you know, on a month by month or year by year basis. Um, but I still think, yeah, it's, it's probably going to be another quite a while, maybe a year before we, we are totally lifting the lid on you know going back to life completely as normal but it's, it's anyone's guess really you know? yeah they, they estimate that uh, that 60 percent of us will eventually have contact with it um so i suppose the whole strategy is to flatten the curve to give everyone a chance at uh, an icu bed if you need it um mm -hmm. but we can't just do this indefinitely and like our society will collapse like it would just everyone stays at home for a year yeah. so i'd say probably what will happen is when they lift restrictions maybe like kind of 
younger, low risk people will go back to work first. And probably start getting it actually, but managing it in the community more, yeah, yeah. you know? So it's probably, it's probably going to be more like a staged mm. herd immunity kind of process, I suppose. So unfortunately those cocooned might have to persist Soon a little bit, bit longer. longer. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. But hopefully though, I mean, I think it would be, I think it would be really good. I think essential probably for the for the mental health and well being of older people as well that they just at least be allowed out for some exercise or some kind of limited contact, you know, with mm. family and and you know grandkids yeah. and you know, um, yeah. Because I mean, you've got to look at quality of life as well as you know as well as the numbers and things like that. So, yeah. And I suppose the thing is to remember as well is as deadly as the virus is, it's not a death sentence for all the old people. Like we've we've seen well, a lot of old people in nursing homes coming through it, fine, you know, mild illnesses uh, in their nineties. It's very unpredictable, I think, yeah. isn't it? But you have yeah. to you have to look at yeah, who's the most likely to to be at risk from it, and yeah, yeah. what are the best ways to protect them, I suppose. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And on a more human level, uh, do my grandchildren or your children comment on it? Are they? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're aware of it because it's in the news and obviously because of our job we you know we we discuss it you know over their heads a lot. Um but I definitely like I've they played t teddy bears hospital with their teddies the last day and some of them had covid-19, you know. <laughs> um and I was asked was it contagious, which I think means contagious. Mm -hmm. So they were wondering could their teddies pass it to each other and things. Um so yeah, they're definitely aware of it and I think um you know obviously they ask about why can't they see their grandparents and you know like why when can they go to the shops when can they go to McGreevy's to buy a toy or an ice cream and um so you know we've been telling them you know what about that it is a virus and that it can you know it can be dangerous for kind of some people and that we have to we have to be careful not to spread it around and stuff so I think like most children they have an understanding you know um of, of at least a base to a basic degree of what's going on okay well go on Actually, it's interesting that uh, one quite often the intensive care patients are kind of men over 50 who are obese. And that's because when you're obese, your, your body's in a pro-inflammatory state. So your immune system kind of goes off the charts, really, in response to this virus, uh, more so than it should do. And it's, and it's the same, uh, say, if you're asthmatic or if you're arthritis, that if you're obese, your, your inflammatory response is much worse, you have much more symptoms. Um, so it's definitely one of the, the learning points is um, for, for a healthy living, really, is get that weight down, you know, and, um, and, and exercise as well. Um, That's probably the biggest tool that we have at our disposal right now is just modifying people's lifestyle factors. So trying to get people to stop smoking and exercise more. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah. Reduce food intake, which is kind of very difficult in the cocooning or uh, isolation. Yes. And okay. yeah, maybe reducing down from three meals a day to two meals a day is, is uh, one way to do it. Yeah. Well, thanks a million. Okay. Uh, keep, well, keep safe, as I say. And I suppose yes. I have to say to myself, keep in for another while. <laughs>